Articles of Faith is a weekly interview show featuring scholars and writers who have written about the doctrines and teachings of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Articles of Faith is a production of Fair Mormon and is hosted by Nick Galletti. Dr. Valerie Hudson joined the faculty of Texas A&M University at the Bush School in 2012 as the George Bush Chair. She is considered an expert on international security and foreign policy analysis. She received her Ph.D. in political science at The Ohio State University. Prior to going to Texas A&M, she also taught at Brigham Young University. In 2009, Foreign Policy named her one of the 100 most influential global thinkers. Dr. Hudson developed a nation-by-nation database on women at womanstats.org. This project triggered both academic and policy interest, including use by both the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee and various agencies of the United Nations. Her research and teaching experience is also complemented by three major teaching awards and numerous research awards. For more information on Valerie Hudson, you can go to vmrhudson.org. She comes to us today under the nom de plume V.H. Kassler to discuss her article in the seventh volume of the online journal Square Two, found at square2.org. Welcome, Dr. Valerie Hudson. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. So I, I, I first wanted to address something that perhaps might be a little superficial, but yet you, you've made the choice for some reason. You wrote this article for Square Two under this name, V.H. Kassler, as opposed to Valerie Hudson or Valerie M. Hudson. Or Could you clear up why you, you went with that name? Yeah, I made a vow to myself uh, years ago that when I wrote something about church doctrine on women, that I could only really know for sure by having married my dear husband, David Kassler, and been in a good marriage with a good man, that I would use his surname to honor him. Oh, okay. The other question I have that perhaps fits you uh, more perfectly than than other guests would be, uh, you know, something related to the issue of women and gender studies, as that is kind of one of the things that you focused on through the years. Um, there are people that you call, you know, that are that are men's men's, you know, the guys, the the guys that look like real men to men. Is there a woman version of that? Is there a woman's woman? And if so, what would that look like? Gosh, I, I'm, I'm just not on board with the assumption. I mean, it seems to me that from a doctrinal point of view, a man's man is Jesus Christ, right? Okay. And a, a woman's woman, we have many examples, such as Mother Eve and uh, Mary. Uh, so, I don't know, it seems to me that, you know, those among us who have perfected, you know, the virtues most completely <laughs> are, are should be our ideal types. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, okay. Whether they look like, you know, Mr. Universe or not, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, your article is kind of, is sort of a time capsule or, or a cultural snapshot of the current discourse in the LDS world about the roles of women women in the priesthood, this ordained women movement, of course. Uh, You're also a self-proclaimed feminist, which is a designation that's become kind of vague in some respects today, or at least ambiguous. Uh, There's different waves of feminism. There's different implications of what being a feminist implies. Uh, But you say that because you're a Mormon, you are a feminist. Uh, I'd be interested in how you, first of all, define what it means, what your version of feminism is, and then and then how that dovetails with Mormonism. Sure. I think, you know, there's there's many different flavors of feminism because, you know, there's many different flavors of people. But I think foundationally, feminism asserts that women and men stand before each other as equals and that they stand before God as equals and that women and men are of equal worth, that they should be paid equally for doing the same job, that they should have equal voice and equal say in the councils of human decision-making. And by the standard, I really believe that every Latter-day Saint, male or female, is a feminist. Why is it that that being a feminist means you're being equal? Why can't you be a humanist then? Oh, because I think foundationally, the binary between male and female 
has been coded throughout human history as being hierarchical in nature, right? That man is up here and woman is down there. And so this encoding of a deep, deep hierarchy, superior, inferior, superordinate, subordinate, you know, fully human being, maybe a human being, but of a lesser variety, I, that has infected not only our interpersonal relationships, you know, male and female, it's infected our entire society. Uh, and as a result, if to believe in a different paradigm, that is, that there could be a, a, a difference, right, a primary difference, such as sex, and that that need not be coded hierarchically, right? Okay. That is a completely different worldview and one that accords with the kingdom of heaven. And that's why we say that men and women are feminists. It's not to elevate females over males, but to take that lower binary sex, the female, and say, no, no, I am a champion of females. I am a champion of equality in the context of difference. Those are the two different worlds that each of us are confronted with, the old toxic world of hierarchical sexual relations and a revolutionary world of equality in the context of difference. So in other words, because historically women have been considered a, a, at a lower level, in order to make them equal, you need to be for the rights of women. Yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, there are really only two ways to live. (laughs) The first way or the second way. And the second way is the pathway of the kingdom of God. That's why it's so revolutionary. Excellent. Well, before we move further into the article on Square Two's online journal, I think it would be good to give kind of a brief introduction as to what that journal is and what people can expect to find with Square Two. Because you were involved with its foundation, is that right? Yes, I'm so glad you've asked that question. Um, Square Two is like one of uh, my uh, children. I love it very much, (laughs) and I see its potential, and I see its growing pains. Um, A group of us, um, primarily those who were at BYU, um, such as Ralph Hancock um, and and others, felt that there was... um, kind of a unfilled niche in the world of online Mormondom. And that was an, um, uh, an online journal of faithful LDS scholarship about contemporary world issues. And, uh, you know, to a certain degree, BYU studies could be, you know, speak to that. But I think um, we saw some uh, ways in which we could go beyond what BYU studies was able to do. And so we took it upon ourselves to um, uh, create this online journal, uh, and we have an editorial board, half of which are sort of older people and half of which are younger people, half of which are female, half of which are male. Is that on purpose, uh, or did it just happen absolutely. that way? Absolutely. Okay. No, 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 that's absolutely on purpose. Uh, and so um, our editorial board members um, include uh, older scholars, such as uh, George Handley at BYU. I mentioned Ralph Hancock. Uh, we've got John Marks Maddox at uh, National Defense University. Uh, we've got Susan Madsen from UVU. A whole you know, host of, of good, faithful um, scholars of, shall we say, the older generation. And then we've got all these wonderful young people uh, and uh, some of them are Ph.D. candidates at um, places like the University of Maryland or Ohio State. Um, uh, some are stay-at-home moms. Uh, you know, we just got a Just a wide huge variety. variety. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and we hope that our readers um, see Square Two as a different kind of place, uh, a place where... You know, you you have to back up your assertions, right? There's got to be some careful scholarship involved. It's not a blog, right? It's also a place where comments are moderated, so it's not the wild, wild west out there. Mm -hmm. And we only publish um, things that we believe are doctrinally sound. Well, how often do you guys put out stuff? Um, Three times a year. 
So we have a spring, summer, and fall issue. Okay. And so you can go to square2.org, and if you want to see everything we've ever published, um, just hit the tab called Journal Issues, and up will come, um, you know, a table of contents, if we, if you will, of every journal issue. Okay. We're well, now in our seventh year. Yeah, and this this article that you've written appears in Volume Seven. It's kind of would you call it like the the head headline article or the kind of the first one or I don't know how you guys would would describe what you what you would do. Um, yeah, we usually pick as our sort of our first article one that we think will have sort of a timely appeal, uh, and and lately the timely appeal has been over issues of women in the priesthood. Sure. Well, and you have a book out. Uh, called Women in Eternity, Women in Zion, where you kind of explore these ideas of separating doctrine from culturally accepted precepts, uh, specifically with gender issues. You address this theme also in this same article in Square Two, and the article's entitled Zion in Her Beauty Rises, Current Discourse on Women and the Priesthood by Ballard, Dew, and Oaks. So to start out, you you address some of these previously held cultural approaches to the discourse on the role of women in Mormon culture and doctrine. So let's let's lay those out. What are some of those past cultural positions that were held by some some people throughout the church? Yeah, well, I think the first one is summed up by the notion of, you know, uh, as a woman, you hold the priesthood every night when you go to bed with your husband, right? The notion that um, women didn't have priesthood power, but they were married to someone who had priesthood power. So they had access and to so, it. Yeah, so as long as you have access to the blessings of the priesthood, it doesn't matter whether you yourself are being a divine power or not. And then I think, you know, women, you know, I don't know about you, but in my home, my mother was a powerful force. And I think I'm probably a powerful force in the lives of my children. And I think women really began to know that they were beings of power. Uh, they experience themselves as that. And so then we sort of get the new cultural, or not new, but we get the older cultural trope of, well, yeah, he's the head of the household, but I'm the neck that moves the head. Right. Right? And so the notion is, okay, maybe I'm underneath, I'm not the head, right? But I'm the one who really knows what's going on. The, <laughs> is this, the is this, the, this is the women wears the pants <laughs> argument? Is that kind of along no, the same lines? No, no, it's... It, no, no, no. It's not the women wear the pants. It's um, Have you seen the movie Brave? Yes. Well, it's the Queen Eleanor, right? <laughs> okay. She's the one who knows what's going on, right? She's but one she in tune. she tells her husband, right, what he should do, how to, you know, conduct himself, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, okay. So I don't think that's very flattering, you know, to to men, right? So I think with both of these, you know, the... I hold the priesthood when I go to bed at night, or he may be the head, but I'm the neck. You know, I think <laughs> neither one of these are very healthy views of women and men. It's still very really. imbalanced, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> and so I think uh, I think we're moving towards a healthier place, and I think that's why I was, you know, I actually was going to write something else for this Square 2 issue, um, and and yet I felt really pressed, perhaps by the spirit, that these, um, what we had been hearing over the last 18 months was so extraordinary yeah. um, that I, I, as you know, when El, um, Elder Oaks gave that talk in the priesthood session of conference, it was like, all right, I'm putting aside this other article I was going to write. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got to do it. I've got to write it. You know, we've, we've got too critical a mass here of fascinating um, new statements uh, that we need to stop and assess. Sure. Well, you even recognize in the article that there is this change in discourse since even kind of the start of the 21st century. And so general authorities are becoming more assertive with this doctrine of gender equality. Yeah. And you actually fo- you focus on these statements from particularly M- Elder M. Russell Ballard, uh, Sister Sherry Dew, and Elder Dallin H. Oaks. Perhaps you could give a brief synopsis of, of those three positions. Yeah. Um, Elder Ballard's was the first to come out. He, his uh, August 2013 Education Week talk, and then followed by another talk, was really broke new ground, um, where he, he basically said, look, 
Endowed women hold priesthood power. All right, his quote is, when men and women go to the temple, they are both endowed with the same power, which is by definition priesthood power. And he went on to say, all who enter the house of the Lord officiate in the ordinances of the priesthood. This applies to men and women alike. Mm -hmm. And then he went on to sort of suggest that there's kind of two great works in the plan of salvation, right? And and also seemed to indicate that because there are these two works, kind of the church and the and the work of creating a family, that that implies that there's two powers that are at work as well. Okay. So I think his probably his most famous quote, just as a woman cannot conceive a child without a man, so a man cannot fully exercise the power of the priesthood without a woman. President Sherry Dew's talk um, picked up on Elder Ballard's uh, words. In a sense, she, I think, put some more flesh on the bone. She said, look, you know, women are not required to be ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood to receive their endowments or to serve in positions of authority in the Church. Right. All right? And she asked us to think about what that means. And apparently, you know, from what she says in her book, what that means is that um, there's kind of a distinction, you know, that I'm making kind of arbitrarily because I don't know what kind of words to put to it, but there's kind of priesthood with a capital P, and there's priesthood with a small p. Mm -hmm. And the priesthood with a small p are the powers and the keys and authorities that our Heavenly Father provides to His sons so that they can do His work on earth. But there's apparently some other part of the priesthood with a capital P. There are powers and authorities, maybe even keys, that are given uh, to the daughters of God, and I would argue probably by their mother, to do her work on this world. Heavenly Mother. You Heavenly were... Mother, yes. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly right. And then uh, Elder Oaks, um, he in introduces some fascinating formula formulations. He says, listen, women, when called to a position of authority in the Church, hold priesthood authority, right? Mm -hmm. He says, we're not accustomed to speaking of women having the authority of the priesthood in their Church callings, but what other authority can it be? Right. Right? Which is huge. <laughs> right. Yeah, that was pretty significant when he just came out right and said that. We were like, well, there you go. You're right. What else there would it be? There you go. <laughs> yeah, I think you put these three together, and wow. No, it's it's interesting because as you approach this subject of feminism and, and gender roles, it, it always seemed to be that the discourse in the past was that one person had to be, I guess, diminished in order for the other person to be increased. In other words, in order for women to rise in the church, if you will, to, to find a greater role, that meant that in some way that meant that the men had to be diminished in some way. Did you see yeah, that? Did, did, I, I mean, mean you that's, see that that's happening that's in the past. That's a bad way of seeing it. <laughs> but it, but it happened, right? I mean, it's very real yeah. that that was going on. Yeah. But you know, the, the younger generation, I mean, I taught for almost 25 years at BYU. The younger generation knows how to live equality. And when they begin to become bishops and state presidents and Relief Society presidents and general authorities, watch out. Yeah. Uh, they are comfortable living as equal partners with their spouses. Absolutely. Well, you know what? Oh, go ahead. Listening to strong women as well. Absolutely. And not feeling diminished by listening to, to strong women. Yeah. You know, there, there, there tends to be a temptation when it comes to issues of such as gender or where there seems to be changes in the way that things are either viewed or operate in the church. It's kind of like the chicken, and the egg paradox. And, mm. and, and that's, you know, to give the distinction to this issue, there are some people that may say that this change in discourse is, could be the result of protest or pressure uh, versus divine authority. First, so, so is there merit in even considering the source of the change? Does it matter? Can't divine authority be given based on the petition of God's children? How, how does that come into play? Well, I think I think your last statement sums it up. Why can't it be both? I mean, 
I'm so tired of treating binaries as either or, right? Right. I mean, we were just talking about binaries and, and male and female. Well, this is the same thing, right? So is the church somehow diminished or, or, or God somehow diminished if he hears the petitions of his daughters and sons about issues that, you know, mean a lot to them? I mean, what kind of parent would say, oh, you're asking about that? Well, in that case, I don't want to listen to you. Right. <laughs> I mean, why don't we credit God with being as good a parent as we are in our it own better. homes? We yeah. Fallible morals, right? Absolutely. So I don't see this as some sort of diminishment. What worries me, all right, is that some of the wonderful women and men who have staked a position on ordaining women have made it into an either-or. That is, you know, if the Church does not ordain women to the Melchizedek priesthood, is the Church untrue? Are they going to leave the Church? I mean, that's... It's an ultimatum. That's the downside, right? That's the downside. I really think the call should have been, we petition for greater light and knowledge on this issue, which we are very troubled by because it seems to indicate this and this and this. But to say, ordain women, or, you know, what's the or? What's the, on the other side of that or? Well, and it does, it's it's a potent issue at this time, and there's a lot of people that claim that they've had certain pains as a result of this, uh, maybe faith crisis, as they've wrestled with the, the, the issues surrounding gender and, and priesthood issues. And you actually conclude with a really beautiful and intriguing statement that I think can kind of answer some of that, that pain. And I'll give the quote from the article. It says, I agree with Sherry Dew when she predicts that the kingdom of God will change overnight for the better when we move to higher ground on these questions. And the questions here being, of course, those surrounding gender roles and doctrines in the LDS church. But perhaps you'd be willing to elaborate a little further on how this is the case, how the kingdom of God will change overnight. What do you mean by that? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. I, You know, when I read Cherry Dew, I realized in an instant, I, you know, it was, I felt so strongly that she was absolutely right. And as I thought about it more, I tried to express in the article, if priesthood with a capital P is the powers of heaven, that is the powers of our Father in heaven plus the powers of our Mother in heaven, right, then to finally see that God's sons on earth have priesthood power and that God's daughters on earth have priestesshood power and that together, wielding their two powers together, all right, means, in a sense, that the priesthood with a capital P has been restored as well. All right? It makes possible the co-presidency of men and women that is the way of heaven. Right? I really think that incredible power and knowledge and blessings will come to us as we embrace the co-presidency of men and women. And I believe it was even Joseph Smith that said uh, at the establishment of the Relief Society that the priesthood couldn't be fully restored until the Relief Society was, was in place. Is that kind of what you're speaking to? Is that the, that one without the other is incomplete? That's right. And and you would say you might say, well, you know, we have men and women, right? And they're endowed. Yes, we have all the pieces, but we don't have the understanding that what's being joined there in the temple when you get sealed, right, are the powers of heaven that belong to God's sons and the powers of heaven that belong to God's daughters. The joining of these two sets of keys, if you will, right, brings priesthood power with a capital P into every home in a way that I don't think it's been when we say, oh, I hold the priesthood when I go to bed with my husband at night, or he's the head and I'm the neck. Do you see how even though people were being endowed and married in the temple, but if you're living under that view of who women are, I don't think you're living up to the privilege of all of the blessings and the knowledge and the power that comes from seeing your spouse as who they really are. 
Yeah. So with, with Sherry Dew's quote where she says the kingdom of God will change overnight, it's not so much that the actual kingdom will change, but rather our perception of its operations. That's right. And I think when we have an understanding of these things that accords more closely with the government of heaven, we will then be entitled to additional power and additional knowledge that we do not currently have because we were not seeing women as co-presidents. We were seeing them as necks, or we were seeing them as powerless wives of powerful husbands. Well, uh, Valerie Hudson is the author of the article, Zion in Her Beauty Rises, Current Discourse on Women and the Priesthood by Ballard, Dew, and Oaks that can be found in Volume 7 of the online journal Square 2, found at square2.org. Uh, we've just touched on some of the issues and want to encourage you to check out that article. A link to it will be posted here for this episode. Visit us at blog.fairmormon.com. Dot org for that link. Thank you again, Valerie, for coming on. It was delightful. I had a great time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Articles of Faith with your host, Nick Galetti. This has been a production of Fair Mormon. This and other podcasts are available at fairmormon.org. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of Fair Mormon or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Please subscribe to our show in iTunes. Questions or comments can be sent to podcast at fairmormon.org. Tune in each Monday for another episode of Articles of Faith. Thank you for listening.